What's up guys, in this video I'm covering Glide towards photorealistic image generation and editing with text guided diffusion models by the awesome OpenAI team right here. And this is yet another iteration uh, of OpenAI's efforts to improve upon these um, basically text conditioned image generation, uh, image synthesis models. And you're probably familiar with one of their previous models, which is namely uh, DALI, which had amazing results. But as we are going to soon see, um, Glide has even better results and they kind of verified that using uh, human judges. So we're gonna see the results a bit later. But first, with those of you who are not even familiar with DALI, let me, let me show you what the hype is all about. Uh, this is what like Glide produces. So Glide produces these images conditioned on these uh, prompts here. So we have a prompt here, a hedgehog using a calculator, and we can see an image that uh, like Glide generated, which is fairly reasonable. I mean, you as a human probably wouldn't be able to do a much better job, uh, although there are some there is some blur here, which may be to the fact that they're using diffusion models, but we're gonna see and discuss those a bit later. Uh, then we have a like another example, a corgi wearing a red bow tie. And you can see here we have a, this attribute binding. We basically have the model has to understand that red corresponds to bow, bow tie. And then we have purple, the color purple corresponds to this party hat. So the model first has to kind of hallucinate and create those and then the pla to place them on the right spot in the image and make it look like a realistic. And I think they do an awesome job. And <laughs> by the way, I don't know what, like, what, what's up with corgis. I can see corgis everywhere. I guess uh, some of the OpenAI uh, members really likes corgis or it's their kind of uh, in-house uh, pet or something. Uh, another cool picture here, robots meditating in a visp uh, Vipassana retreat. Uh, fairly sure you cannot find this image uh, anywhere, but it'd be nice to see the, the nearest neighbor uh, from the training data set from all of these generated images. Although, yeah, this looks very, very awesome if you ask me. Uh, I'm gonna just cherry pick a couple more examples here. And all of these are also cherry picked already. Uh, they're using something called uh, guidance, uh, like classifier free, if I'm not wrong, let me just check it out here. Uh, classifier free guidance, yeah, that's right. So here we can see uh, a high quality oil, oil painting of a psychedelic hamster dragon. And this is totally wicked, like psychedelic, okay, we can see kind of the, the colors are there. Then we have hamster, hamster is also there. Uh, dragon, we can see these, these wings in the background, which kind of reminds us uh, of the dragon. Uh, high quality, well, I'm not sure about that part, but like oil, oil, it definitely has this oil painting vibe to it. So again, amazing, amazing uh, rendering of, of this, of this uh, prompt here. Uh, many other cool results. We have another Corgi here. Um, and uh, finally, we have uh, this thing here. So a red cube on top of a blue cube. And I'd love to see some more complex query, some more complex prompt where the model would have to do more serious relational reasoning. Uh, because as far as I remember, in the DALI paper, they tried and, 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 and constructed those and the model, the DALI failed. Uh, like it didn't manage to either count well or fail to do the attribute uh, binding correctly, like uh, associate the correct color with the shapes, etc. So it'd be cool to kind of uh, further uh, probe this model, but that's going to be hard because they only released a smaller model, which is trained on a filter data set. So it's not not nearly as, as, as potent as the one they have uh, in house behind, I guess. Yeah, not sure whether they, they, they have an API for the for this glide model. In any case, uh, let's try and understand the magic behind behind this model. So first things first, let me just kind of mention here, uh, when evaluated by human judges, our samples are preferred to those from DALI 87% of the time when evaluated for photorealism and 69% of the time when evaluated for caption similarity. So that's cool. So that means that this model uh, definitely improved upon DALI. And the main like component that, that brought that improvement, uh, I'd say, is these diffusion models. And you're probably familiar with some other generative models such as GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, or VAEs, variational autoencoders, or even flow-based uh, models. But diffusion models are probably new for, for, for most of you uh, because only in 2020 uh, did people man like manage to get them to work, to be in the sense they are, they are now kind of, you can, you can sample very fast 
like relatively speaking, uh, and uh, you can train them and they, they just work. There is a nice relationship between diffusion models and VAEs. We're going to see that the actual loss for the diffusion models is, is inspired by these VAE models. And also there is another class of generative models called score-based models, and I'm going to link a lot of resources down in the video description, so do check it out. Uh, so there is a nice connection with that family as well. I don't have it here, but yeah, you can check it out in the video description. And uh, another thing I want to point out here is that uh, let's let's see the like uh, difference at least on this block diagram. The main difference between um, like uh, all of these models and and diffusion models. And you can see. Let me try and use my fancy new touchpad. Uh, basically, um, you can see that the latents here, the latents here, are completely like they are of the same dimensionality as the as the input image whereas usually when you have uh, something like uh, VAE so, so it's an autoencoder uh, that means you're basically down you're down sampling you're you're reducing the dimensionality of your input data into some uh, latent vector here usually denoted as Z and this one is way like lower dimensional compared to the uh, input uh, input data you're trying to model here on the other si uh, side you're you're basically uh, you're basically uh, keeping the dimensionality uh, the same as, the, as your input. And you can imagine that that can uh, cause some problems training this model and sampling from this generative model, etc. But we're going to see how people manage to, to, to work their way around it. Kinda. I say kinda because before we even dig into details, let me just show you. I mean, there are obviously some limitations and they pointed those out somewhere here. Let me try and find limitations. Okay. Our unoptimized model takes 15 seconds to sample one image on a single A100 GPU. And we're going to understand why this is. Basically, the reason is that we have to do like 20 ish forward passes in order to, to render an image. Whereas using something like GAN or VAE, you do a single forward pass and you've got yourself an image. So that's, that's a limitation to keep in mind. Uh, and yeah, so let's get back up here. Okay, before I even start uh, digging deeper into how diffusion models work, which is going to be a very ungrateful uh, job for me to do because it'll probably take a whole video to do it. So I'm going to do a high level overview. First, let's see just the um, what the model can do on a high level, what the model is capable of. So here we can see some impainting capabilities. And a uh, thing to keep in mind here is that they had to do some fine tuning. So this is not zero shot as, as your DALI model or some of the other like images rendered in this paper. This like model was fine tuned for this precise task of impainting. And you can see the awesome results. Uh, so they, they have this mask and uh, the model uh, inputs. So they, they kind of, I think the, they feed the, the three channeled RGB image. They also feed this this mask as a separate channel. And I think they have a couple more channels in that impainting model, but that's not that important right now. What's important is you can see that the results are, are fa fairly stunning. Again, here, a girl hugging a corgi on a pedestal. Uh, you can see uh, it rendered corgi pretty awesome like just look at this this like hand wrapping around the body of this corgi i mean the results are if, if you if you told me like a couple of years ago that ai models will be able to do this i'd say it's it's like almost impossible and now i think people are just kind of used to ai being able to do this and we're setting even higher and higher goals and so now this is not like um nothing special but yeah we, we need to appreciate the, the 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 progress that happened since 2012 and of course earlier than that but yeah with the AlexNet, the things really started skyrocketing same thing here you can see the red hair you can see uh how the the, the ways of flowers appears uh I especially find this one fascinating. The hat lies perfectly, like the perspective, the the color. Maybe the color is a bit brighter. You can see the, the hopefully you can see it on your screen. The color is a bit brighter compared to this shirt here. So yeah, but still uh, fairly stunning results. Um, and yeah, small knit here. Uh, GLAD stands for Guided Language to Image Diffusion for Generation and Editing. You can understand why it is. We can both generate, we can edit, as you can see here. We have language that's conditioned. We are basically conditioning our, our diffusion model on, on some language prompt, and we basically generate images using the diffusion models. So that's kind of trying to de deconstruct that, that complex sentence. Uh, here are some more like uh, awesome capabilities of Glide model. Uh, you can see here that um, First, uh, they kind of generate using the Acosia living room. 
they uh, zero shot generate the, this image of the cozy living room and then they put a mask like a mask here and then they say a painting of a corgi on the wall above a couch and here comes Corgi again. And then they put a mask again, and then they say a round coffee table in front of a couch. And here comes the table, and it's round. And that's, I mean, fairly awesome. And then again, they put this mask, and they say a vase of flowers on the coffee table. And again, we, we see the, the results rendered. And finally here, they say, they put a mask here, and they say a couch in the corner of a room. And now I think this is a failure case, or I may be missing something out. But basically what happened is that we just got ourselves a window here, but I don't see like a couch in the corner of a room. Or maybe or maybe it kind of cropped this part. So now this is, this is like, officially in the corner of a room although we don't see the wall here so but but anyways it, uh, that's maybe me being too uh, nitpicky here but the, yeah the results are, are fairly cool uh, here they just show some combination using this as the edit and here they kind of uh, like instead of putting this generic mask with a generic shape, they kind of help the model a bit more by using both, this is kind of semantic uh, segmentation in a way, and they put up approximate shape, and so it's easier to, to generate the picture here. You can see, uh, you can see the results yourself here. Okay, so that's what uh, Glide can do. Now, let me try and demystify uh, how this thing actually works, and it's gonna be very, uh, very, uh, hard to try and explain how these diffusion models work very quickly but yeah let, let me try it uh, if you think the explanation was not good enough i can maybe try uh just kind of upvote my comment and i can i can create another video explaining just the diffusion models okay so the the, the process itself these diffusion models were inspired by some uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics i know it sounds very very complicated because it is but like uh back in 2015 um the first paper appeared and uh, they managed to 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 they basically originated the idea of the diffusion models but only in 2020 did we get the models to to work nicely to generate nice samples and to be uh like faster and yeah so here is the, the main idea. Um, you have this diffusion process, whereas you, you take your input image and what you do is you basically add, add a certain amount of noise uh, from a specific family. Like usually people use Gaussian because Gaussians are from this thing called exponential family, which means they have all of these nice properties when you add up Gaussians, when you do product with them, you end up with a Gaussian, like the, 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 the structure of the Gaussian remains and it's easy to compute and that's why people are using Gaussians all around, like in VAEs as well for the for the priors, etc, etc. So basically they have nice computational properties. So we add up uh, some noise and then we, do, we continue doing that until we get to uh, like a picture which is basically pure Gaussian noise. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could reverse the process and uh, starting from a Gaussian noise, so just sampling this Gaussian noise picture, reverse the process and generate our data. So that would be cool. So again, we have this uh, conditional distribution. So X of T conditioned on the X of T minus one, which is timestamp, the, the previous timestamp. And we basically know that because that's described by this formula here. And I'm gonna quickly explain uh, how this thing works in a second. And then what's problematic is that we cannot, it's not easy to, to, to figure out the, the uh, reverse uh, distribution here. So, so basically not, not the reverse distribution by the, this conditional distribution where you're trying to figure out the T minus one condition on the X of T. So you're trying to denoise the image here. So what diffusion models are, are trying to do is uh, construct this P of theta, uh, which is going to be a neural network in practice to try and model this this unknown distribution here. And we're gonna see a couple of nice properties of this distribution, which will allow us to actually do that. And okay, before we get there, let me try and dissect this, this formula here. So we can see that uh, uh, the notation is kind of cringy. I, I, I love this notation better when you have like, for example, let me just take the, 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 the uh, touchpad here. So, um, I like it better when you have something like X of T and then you're sampling from the normal distribution or whatever distribution you like. So like having this squiggly thing. Uh, but yeah, just be aware how this notation works. This just means we're sampling X of T from like the Gaussian distribution uh, denoted by N. Uh, and this is the mu. So this thing here, this part here is the mu. So that's the mean. And this thing here is just the covariance matrix. Okay, so let's try and dissect this. So we have X of T minus one. 
multiplied by this thing here. And beta t is something called, uh, I think it's called noise level or something. I forgot the exact name, but whatever. Basically, it's between 0 and 1, <clears throat> which means that this thing here under square, under square root is going to be uh, less than, than, than 1. And that means that we're going to contract this x of t minus 1. Okay, so let me try and visualize this thing right here. Okay, so we have a... Uh, and for the sake of clarity, I'm going to assume that x of t minus 1, which is our image, is actually only three-dimensional data point. So that I can actually visualize what's happening. Otherwise, if this is thousand by thousand, that's million dimensions, which means I cannot draw my million dimensions on my one-node screen here. So here is the uh, coordinate system. So let's say that x of t minus 1 is somewhere here. And so this is the origin point here. It's kind of, let me kind of try and connect it here. So what this thing here does is it's contracting because it's more than one, which means the, the mu, the, the mean of this distribution, and let me take a different color here, let me try and take the green one, is going to kind of push this point from here all the way to somewhere here. Okay, so this is going to be, whoops, this is going to be, wow, I'm still trying to get used to this novel touchpad. <laughs> okay, so we have the point now here, and now this beta is going to be, we're going to have a di diagonal, um, I guess, isotropic uh, covariance matrix, which means we're going to have, I'm going to denote that as some small circle around this point. So we're going to have some Gaussian distribution centered around this point here, and we're going to sample our x of t from that distribution here. And so let's say we sample it. Let me, let me try and change the color here. Let me take the blue color. So let's say we sample a data point here. So that's going to be our, so we started with, with here. So we had a x t minus 1. Now we are here. So this is visually representing in this 3D space what's happening in this image space where we're getting more noisy and noisy images. So maybe uh, from this image we got this one, although this will take more steps, obviously. But yeah, you get a point. Now let's see what happens in the limit. Uh, the thing with these betas is that in the original paper, in I think in the paper from 2020, um, they were not learnable. They just took and uh, created a schedule that started with some larger betas, which are still smaller than one, and then slowly uh, annealed them towards zero, okay? Linearly, I think. So we had a linear schedule. And that means when beta t gets down to zero, what happens? Uh, Actually, it's the other way around. It starts with very small because we want to have a, like lesser noise. So it starts with zero and then it's a nil towards one, okay? That, that will make more sense. So what happens when it gets to one, that means this is going to zero. So this thing here, let me change the color. So I'm going to take the red pen here. And so basically this thing is going to be annealed, it's going to go to zero. And that means that this thing here is going to be contracted all the way down here until we get to the origin point. So that means that after a lot of steps, our data points are going to be basically drawn from, from this, from this uh, like a distribution, which is basically your your uh, standard Gaussian distribution, the normal distribution, because we'll have a mu of zero, because this is zero, so that means this thing is going to be zero, and this thing is going to be one, which means we have identity matrix, and we are basically sampling from a noise, pure noise distribution. And that's what I explained here. So that, that's basically this image here. So uh, that's at the limit of this diffusion process. Now you might think that this would be very slow if we had to sample like, uh, if we had to sample and get uh, x100, uh, we'd have to repeat this sampling procedure 100 times, but that's not the case, luckily for, for us, uh, because you can, you can form, you can, because you can see here, q, x of t, conditioned of x of 0, say so x of 0 is the original image from our data set, the actual images we have in our data set, we can form uh, like a distribution so that we can directly sample and get and kind of skip these intermediate steps and like get the x hundred or x two hundred uh, from a single from a single like a step, and you can see it here again. These alpha t with this hat thing is a product of alpha of these coefficients here, and they are 1 minus beta. And you can imagine, because all of these are smaller than 1, when you multiply a bunch of numbers that are smaller than 1, this thing is going to converge in the limit, it's going to go down to zero, to 0, okay, it's going to go down to 0. So that means what we end up with is nothing here, and we end up with 1 here, which means this thing is going to be equal to this small epsilon here, which is, as you can see here, the normal distribution. So that's what happens again in the, in the limit uh, of this diffusion process.
Now, this is very important. Um, they state here, and this is a, this is actually a, a conclusion from 1949, I think. Uh, they say, note that Q, uh, so this is conditional distribution we are, we're trying to model, approaches a diagonal Gaussian distribution as capital T approaches infinity. And this is the number of steps in our diffusion process. And correspondingly, this, this noise level uh, in the lim goes, goes down to, to zero. So it's sufficient to train a neural network to predict a mean mu theta and a diagonal covariance matrix sigma theta. And so this will be the, this is this thing here, uh, is the distribution we're trying to learn in order to model the actual, the true distribution here. So this one, the unknown one, okay. And the reason why it's possible is because we know that under these con like conditions, the actual true distribution is going to have that same shape, and then we can just kind of learn and kind of fit this Gaussian uh, on top on top of that distribution. Now, if you're familiar with VAEs, uh, this may be uh, oh, this whole like uh, diagram here may be familiar. And if I were to swap, if I were to swap uh, this and kind of change it to and denote it as Z, uh, which is the usual notation in VAEs, because x1 through t are the latents. Remember, I, I mentioned that the latents here in this model are of the same dimension. So these are the latents. These noisy images here are the latents of our of our image here. Uh, and um, basically, if I were to denote these as z, so this one here as z, you may notice this formula from the VAE's construction. And here we're just trying to uh, like construct something that's called evidence lower bound and it's fairly self-explanatory although it may be super confusing when you hear it the first time so why is that why is it called elbow or evidence lower bound so first we have this thing here is called evidence so this is evidence or I think you have to include the log one so that's basically you, you want to maximize this you want to have your data points from your data set have high probability under your fitted distributions under your learned distribution uh, p of theta. So that's what machine learning is, uh, models are, are oftentimes trying to do. We're trying to maximize the probability of the data points under our, our model, okay? Now, because log is monotonic, uh, it actually does not matter whether you're, you're optimizing. Um, you're not going to change the loss function by adding a log. You're going to change some computational properties and the convergence speed, etc. So it's kind of usually neat to have log inside. But, so if we have this, why don't we try and maximize it directly? Well, the problem is it's intractable. So you can try and break this thing down and you end up with something with a complex integral that looks something like this. We have these P theta fx zero and we'll have uh, the prior, so the probability of the actual latent and we'll have to basically integrate all over all of those latents. So as you can see here, we have to sample the latents, the, Z, the, the Zs, we have to have their probabilities, we have to, to construct this, to, to basically compute this integral, which is going to be uh, in, it's simply intractable. So we cannot directly uh, compute this thing here. So this is equal to the probability theta x0. You'd have to do this thing here in order to get this, this probability here. So that's that's out of the question. We can do that. So that's why people are constructing these lower bounds. Uh, and uh, basically, this is trivial by definition because KL divergence is always greater or equal than zero. It's equal only in the case when the two distributions perfectly match which we are, we are trying to do by training these beta t to match the, 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 the p distribution to, to match the, the real q distribution. So after doing some uh, algebra here, I'm not gonna dig into a lot of details, uh, we end up with this formula here. And this is uh, what we call the, the elbow, the, the uh, like, like a variance uh, lower bound uh, like loss. And you can see here that basically if we tried and uh, minimized uh, this thing, we know that th it's gonna be, the, the actual thing we care about uh, is gonna be even lower. So why it's called lower bound if it's actually higher because usually you don't have the minus. And then you're trying to maximize this thing and this thing is gonna be smaller or equal. And that means as you're maximizing it, you know that the actual thing you care about, which is the, the, the evidence here, so this thing here is gonna be at least as big as your loss. So this is also called a surrogate loss because you're trying to find a different loss that's kind of going to bound your actual thing you care about. Okay.
So long story short, what happens is they, they kind of uh, further have to uh, break down this, this equation so that it's actually tractable and computable. So they just end up in a sum of various KL divergences. And at the end, they end up uh, with a simple MSC loss between the, the, uh, the mu theta. So that's the, the thing we're trying to, to learn here, the mu theta of our P theta distribution and they just need to do MSC loss. But what happens is they actually, instead of figuring out the mu, they actually just figure out the noise level that happens in a, that happened in a specific step. And let me tr try and break that down in a second. Oops, by the way, I, I realized I forgot to put to condition this on z, z. So you have to condition, so it's P of x zero given z, and we, we, see, we look at the probability of z. So what's the probability of z, and then what's the probability of this x zero being, uh, so what's the probability of x0 given that z? So we have to integrate all of that to get the actual probability of x0. So it's a small mistake. Hopefully you can, you can see what's happening there. Um, anyways, on a high level, just it's hard, it's intractable. That's everything I want you to keep in mind. That's it. You don't have to know the, the, the probability details here. Okay, so let me try and uh, break this down. Why, why, they're, why they're, what they're doing here. So instead of figuring out mu, so that means instead of, let's let's say, let me go back to this picture here. So let's say this is x of, this is x of t, and this was x of t minus one. This point here was x of t minus one, this one is x of t. So instead of trying to predict, given x of t, trying to predict this this mu here, so that, that that's the point from where we generated in the first place this point x of t. Instead of doing that, they figure out the noise, which is the same thing in the end. We're gonna see that, but it's a, it's a bit different. So let's say we had an image here. So let's say we had an image here and it had some amount of noise, like it, it had a couple of noise points here. I'm gonna reduce the amount of noise, obviously, to make it easier to, to explain. So we wanna basically from there on, we wanna understand which portions of the noise were added going from step t minus one to step t. We wanna understand which of these noise points were added. So maybe we f figure out, okay, these were the noise points. That was the noise that was added. And basically we end up with something like this. We end up with a image here that has these two, but we, we kind of get got rid of this of this noise here. And you can imagine by doing this, we are reducing the noise and at the end, we're gonna end up with the final picture that's noise-free image from our data distribution. And that's awesome. So that's what's happening. They're trying to reduce and, and understand what was the noise that was added between the two steps. That's, that's everything I want you to understand here. Uh, and that's uh, what they do exactly here. So you can see here, we have this L simple, so the simple loss, because they had some simplifications here, but this turned out to work quite nice empirically. So let's see how this uh, L simple works. So we have expectation over, the time step goes from one to capital T, which is the size of our diffusion chain, let's call it that way. We are sampling X zero from our from the true distribution. So this is a fancy way of saying we take a data sample, we take an image from our data set, and we sample epsilon from the like a normal like Gaussian distribution right here. Okay, so we're gonna. What happens in practice? How this model is going to be trained is the following. Let me let me change the color here. We're gonna sample x zero, which means we take. So we sample. Let me let me do it like this. Whoops. So we sample x zero here. So that means we take an image. Then we sample t. So that may, may be hundred in one single like training pass. So we have we have 100, we have a specific image and because we have this specific we have this this cool thing that we got here that means we can kind of jump over. We don't have to do 100 sampling steps. We can just directly calculate the x of t because of this formula here. So that means now we have x of t. Okay. So now we have x of t which means we can feed it here. We can feed x of t into our epsilon theta model. We can also feed the timestamp. And how do you feed a scalar, you may ask, into a neural network? Well, please remember transformers. You're basically, what, what happens, they're using the same thing as with transformers. They're using these uh, basically uh, Fourier, basically these uh, sinusoids, and they index into a table of pre-computed sinusoids, and they just take a single row of there, and they, they kind of append it and add it to the model. That's that's how you convert scalar into into 
into a vector. Check out my video on the transformer paper if you didn't understand that. And now you're just trying to regress this, this epsilon. That's it. So uh, that's how the whole procedure works. And once you train the model, once you have this epsilon theta model trained, how you actually generate the mu theta is using this formula, which kind of is simple after a couple of simple algebraic manipulations you end up with this formula and now you can just input x of t you input the predicted epsilon theta and you end up with the mu theta which is the mu theta for the x of t minus one so that's the the the, the mu the, the mean from where the less noisy version of the image came from so remember going to our visualization here that means we found a mu up the diffusion chain where the image was less noisy. Okay, that was my best attempt at trying to make these diffusion models a bit more clear. Uh, it took me a couple of days to wrap my head around this. I had to read four papers, I had to read a couple of blogs, and I'm still, until you start and until you try and implement this thing yourself, you're gonna miss a, like out on the details, but the high level picture is here. You have this process of, of, of uh, adding noise, you have this uh, ability to reverse the process because of this nice property that the uh, the actual conditional distribution, so the x uh, t condition x t minus one, sorry, the the x t minus one condition x t is also of the Gaussian uh, form, and that makes life uh, a lot easier. And yeah, basically, you're trying to figure out what part of the current image is the actual noise, and that's how you're denoising with every single step. And finally, you end up with the image from your probability distribution, which is hopefully as close as possible to the actual data distribution if you train your model correctly. Uh, and that was the the hardest part to understand about this paper. Now, after you know that, uh, now let's let's see a couple more details. Um, there's some guidance they're using in order to 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 be able to not just generate unconditional images, but take the piece of text like. Uh, as I showed you here, you take a piece of text, you condition the model additionally, and then you generate uh, an image and not just generate an image. So um, here, let me let me kind of dig in uh, deeper here. So for our main experiments, we train a 3.5 billion parameter text conditional diffusion model at 64 times 64 resolution, and another 1.5 billion parameter text conditional upsampling diffusion model to increase the resolution to 256, 256. For clip guidance, we also train noise aware, blah, 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 VAT, blah, blah, blah. That's not that important. What's probably worth mentioning here is that it's noise aware, which means you ha you cannot take an off-the-shelf VAT. You, ha you have to retrain it uh, with noisy images, noisy samples to get the uh, correct results. Uh, more important than that, how do we condition on text? And the answer is simple, transformers. So to condition on the text, we first encode it into a sequence of K tokens and feed these tokens into a transformer. So then they say the output of the transformer is used in two ways. They, they First, the final token embedding is used in place of a class embedding in the ADM model, which is the diffusion model I was just explaining. Second, the last layer of token embeddings, uh, a sequence of K feature vectors is separately projected to the dimensionality of each attention layer throughout the ADM model. Basically, in this is very ar architecture specific. What they do is they take the uh, output of the uh, transform model. So again, we have a text here. We have some text here, like, uh, I don't know, whatever, some text, and then you pass that through a transformer, the almighty transformer here. So that's T for transformer. Outcome, the feature vectors, and you basically use these feature vectors and you input them in a smart way into the diffusion model. So this is the diffusion model. Let me kind of draw a box here. So something like this, diffusion model, you condition the on, on these feature vectors, and that's the, the final pipeline. That's how the conditional uh, thing works. So the training itself remains the same. You you still have you still have uh, this diffusion thing. You just now you all you at all times you'll have the captions. You'll have the associated caption with each of these images. You'll have a caption here. You have a caption here, which will be the same throughout this whole chain. And uh, basically, you're gonna use that information additionally and train uh, the, the 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 yeah the the, the text conditioned uh, version of this of this model. Okay. So what turned out to be the case is that you can you can even further improve the results by having a dedicated classifier. Uh, basically manipulate your 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 training procedure here uh, and let me try and explain how that works so 
for for a moment, uh, forget that we are working with text and uh, think of this like MNIST. We are trying to just, let's say we have 10 classes and instead of uh, passing the text through transformer, we just take, a, I don't know, like a one hot encoding of our class and we input that instead of uh, to condition to condition the model. So what I do is uh, they take the, the data set, they basically take the data set and they train a classifier. So they have a classifier here, like I just, you know, the C that's going to be probably some convolutional neural network or something, or VAT, I don't know. Uh, and you, you take the noisy versions of your sample and you, you, you teach this model to predict the class. You teach it to predict the correct class, like maybe it's going to be C1 like dog or whatnot. And now, because this model knows how to, given an image, it can predict the correct class, now you can use that model to guide the, the training procedure and improve the uh, samples. We've seen this with clip guided uh, VQVA models and some other generative models. Basically, you can see that all throughout Twitter, uh, yeah, nowadays. But yeah, uh, in a nutshell, what happens, how this is implemented is we are going to, uh, remember, we're trying to predict the mu. We're just going to have some, some scalar coefficient here. Uh, which is basically going to ampl amplify the influence of the gradients with respect to the input image of the log of P phi phi y uh, condition on xt. So this is uh, looks very complicated, but this is basically our, our classifier. So this is basically our classifier. And we are trying to... So what happens here on a semantic level is that, hey, we know, we, because we have the gradient, we know how to tweak x of t, how to change the pixels of x of t in order to maximize the the, 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 the probability of the class. So that means, so that's something you, you can see in Deep Dream. You can check out Deep Dream if you're not familiar with it. But basically, let's say you have, an, like, let me just kind of draw an image here. So you have an image here and you'll know how to tweak the particular pixels so that a particular class here, let's, let me denote it as a, as a, like a softmax distribution or something. Uh, like discrete one or whatnot. So you, you know this is the correct class. For example, let me just change the color. Uh, so you know this is the correct class. And what you do is you tweak this so that you kind of boost that particular class. That's the whole point. That's what gradients are there for. And uh, because you have that information, uh, you can use that to tweak the mu so if we were to get back to the uh, drawing I, I, I showed you up here, let me just try and find it here. That means instead of this time, instead of going uh, right, so instead of going from, from, from here to here, the classifier is smart enough to tell you, hey, if you wanna create a class of a dog, instead of going here, so instead of going from here to here, it's better that you move a little bit towards here. And so this is the better path according to the classifier. So this thing here is going to be a better class. And yeah, I mean, that's that's what happened. That's what the formula is telling us. I didn't explain you how the actual formula was derived, but yeah, that's going to be uh, enough for now. So that's one um, way of how they are conditioning the, um, guiding the, the generation process of the, uh, for the particular class. And there is another uh, thing they do is classifier free guidance. Um, the idea here is not to have a dedicated classifier because you can imagine it's very expensive to train a separate dedicated classifier on the noisy samples this time. So you cannot take an off the shelf uh, uh, like a model. You have to train it on the noisy data and that's expensive. You wanna, you wanna avoid that if possible and that's where the classifier free uh, basically uh, part of this text comes from. So classifier free, we do not want to have a classifier if we don't have to. So let me let me walk you through this because it's fairly important since they got uh, better results using this classifier free approach compared to using a clip as the guidance uh, model. Uh, so they say here, uh, instead of training a separate classifier model, we choose to train an unconditional denoising diffusion model P theta of Z. The notation is a bit different, but bear with me. I, uh, yeah, parameterized to a score estimator A E theta of uh, Z L. Uh, this is the thing we just saw. This is the, the noise we're trying to, to learn. Together with the conditional model uh, P theta Z conditioned on C, parameterized to um, the, yeah, 
basically the E theta ZLC model. So that's basically our model. We're just additionally conditioning that 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 model we're we're learning. So we use a single neural network to, param to parameterize both models. Where for the unconditioned model, we can simply input zeros for the class identifier C when predicting the score. Uh, I.e., we just put the C equals to zero for that model. And we jointly train the unconditional and conditional models simply by randomly setting C to the unconditional class identifier. So we have a, like, they basically have a same network. And sometimes with some uh, probability, they are, they are basically zeroing the, the class. Uh, and that's how they're training the unconditional and the conditional um, like uh, diffusion model at the same time. And finally, we then perform sampling using the following linear combination of the conditional and unconditional score estimates. And I'm fairly sure this formula is uh, broken, uh, that this here is actually the correct formula. So I'm going to now jump to this uh, paper. And it says that in order to get the final estimate, we are going to take the, the prediction that we got by using the uh, like unconditioned uh, version plus s minus the, this difference here. So what this means geometrically is the following. So we have this, this thing uh, e theta uh, conditioned on the uh, zero, that means it's unconditioned. So it says, hey, if you wanna generate a, a, a cool denoised image, uh, go, so we are here, go in this direction, okay? So now this thing here, the difference tells us, hey, this thing, the the uh, the condition model is smarter because it learned how to generate conditioned images. So it's gonna say, hey, instead of there, go here, okay? And so you can imagine that the difference vector here is gonna be the green thing. So we are, from this, we are subtracting this. So that means we're gonna end up with this vector here. And so what this is telling you is, hey, instead of going with the blue or with the red one, we're gonna go first with the red one. So that's the unconditioned generator. And then we're gonna do, so we can now amplify this difference vector by how much we want. So that, that may be like two or something. So that means, hey, we wanna do it like this. So go to twice there. And so basically we end up going going in this direction or something like that. So that's the the, the high level idea of how, of how this should, is supposed to, to work. Yeah, there is obviously a lot of theory for why this is, um, yeah, I, I think I think this was mostly empirical finding. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. And now uh, I was constantly talking about uh, like simple uh, class conditioning because remember we're, we're working with text here. The uh, version they're actually using is uh, like conditioning on captions and uh, this it means just empty, empty uh, text sequence. And uh, that's, that's yeah, we sometimes replace text captions with an empty sequence during training. So that's how we, we, we get into the, from the class conditions uh, world into the uh, text condition world, okay. Also, also uh, here I explain to you how the guided diffusion would work in the case where we are conditioning on a class. But remember, again, we're working with text. So they are going to use clip. And they say here they are protruding the reverse process mean along the gradient of the text image job product with respect to the image. So that's here. This may, may be a bit overwhelming. Protruding the reverse process mean is what I explained up there. So we are, as you can see, we're protruding the mean with the gradients of whatever is this. And in the case of clip, it's gonna be, uh, we're protruding the mean along the gradient of the text image dot product with respect to the image. Go ahead and check out my clip uh, video if you haven't watched that one, if, you, if you're not familiar with clip. But here briefly, what clip does is you're basically going to have um, like an image here. Uh, and that's, so let me just change the color here. So the image and the the, the texts, the, 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 the captions are going to be uh, uh, embedded in the joint space. And so what happens is you have an image here and you have some pieces of text here. And you're gonna do dot product because they're in the same space. That means they're like I don't know, like three-dimensional vector or three-dimensional vector. It's gonna usually be higher dimensionality, but for the sake of argument, and you're gonna do dot product between them. Now, if you're trying to generate a specific caption, like the hamster, the dragon ha hamster from from the example I showed you in the beginning, what you wanna do is again. So this is an image here. You'll want to tweak the pixels such that this dot product between these two, such that this dot product goes up, okay? 
and that's that's these uh, you're, you're, you're basically that's those are the gradients here that's what this formula is capturing so instead of in the case of class conditioning you're trying to maximize just the probability of a class here you're trying to maximize the match between the image and a particular caption for which you're trying to generate this image so remember you're given the caption and you want to generate a specific image and so you're using this clip model to learn how to change the image so that you can better describe and uh, generate the the corresponding image for this particular caption so that's it okay that was a lot of details uh yeah let me know whether this this format was too 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 many details or not but yeah now we're gonna just see the results and that's pretty much it uh thing worth noticing is that uh they they made sure that the training compute is roughly equal to that used to train the lee so that they can fairly compare uh both models and um you can read this part yourself if you're if you're curious to know more uh i basically uh they basically describe how the um, how the model is fine tuned for the image painting task uh, in painting task and how uh, some additional details about the uh, guidance procedure. Uh, here they compare glide using uh, class uh, class uh, classifier free guidance, clip guidance, dolly, some GAN versions, and the real images. You can see the results. And uh, let me just kind of uh, maybe focus on this column here. Uh, and you can see that using uh, classifier free guidance is creates better images, uh, arguably uh, uh, compared to the clip guidance, and better than than Dali. Uh, although I took a single column, but yeah, I think we can agree that a group of elephants walking in a muddy water. This also looks better than this one. That's for sure because it's kind of. Uh, like a blurry and that has to do with the fact that they're using in the background a discretized version of the VAE model that's how DALI works you can again check my video if you're not familiar with DALI um, so uh, those are some 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 comparison results here what they've done is they've compared I'm gonna skip these curves but basically they compared how classifier free uh, guidance compares to clip guidance and uh, it turns out that uh, cl classifier free is also better uh, looking at these metrics except for this one where uh, the one of the metrics was actually clip score so what happened is that uh, basically uh, the 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 adversarial examples made it look like the the uh, clip guidance is better but it's actually not the classifier free guidance is better so they say here we hypothesize that clip guidance is finding adversarial examples for the evaluation clip model rather than actually outperforming classifier free guidance when it comes to matching the prompt i guess that would be my first hypothesis as well uh, for why this thing happens you can see here uh, like the clip guidance model has for the higher score it has lower fid which means basically that uh, F, lower FID is better. So that means that this curve, the orange curve in this particular case is, is the better one. Okay, so they did some comparisons with the Lee model. Uh, they they uh, tried really hard to make uh, Glide uh, as bad as possible and the Lee as, as good as possible and still they got always better results. You can see here everything above 50% means that uh, Glide is better than the Lee and that's the case as you can see across all of the columns and all of the rows. So this row means that uh, they're using Clip to re-rank the output images of Dali and they use I think like 512 or something uh, attempts from Dali and then they take the best one using clip model. So the clip model is ranking the images for a particular caption and that's how they improve from no ranking to Dali re-ranked and then here what they do is they just blur the output of glide by passing it through the vqvae model if i'm not wrong from the dali and that's make that makes it blur and that's why we saw up there we saw up there that this dali image here is way more blurred compared to the output of glide so then they pass the uh, glide image through that same model that caused this and they still compare them and it's still better compared to dali so that's a very very encouraging result Okay, finally, some safety considerations a section. Um, they, as I said, they open sourced the smaller version of a model that was trained on this filter data set. So they say here, we filtered out training images containing people to reduce the capabilities of the model in many uh, people-centric problematic use cases. Okay, that's one of the attempts they, 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 they try to do. So it's a 300 million, it's a way smaller model. Remember that the big one is like in the billions uh, of parameters. Uh, yeah. 
uh, ballpark. And uh, they say here that we also probed Clyde, the filtered version, so the small filtered version, for some forms of bias and found that it retains and may even amplify biases in the data set. For example, when asked to generate toys for girls, our model produces more pink toys and stuffed animals than it does for the prompt toys for boys. I mean, this thing is kind of funny. Like, I mean, of course that that's going to happen because the way our society works is that girls are playing with more pink toys when they are young. I mean, this kind of seems weird to me. The model is just reproducing whatever is present in the data set. I mean, we can all agree on this. So, uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts on, on this particular statement here. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And uh, finally, some, some failure cases. Uh, an illustration of a cat that has eight legs. Uh, yeah, you can see it failed. Uh, I mean, maybe the model here thought that these are four legs here. And then there are two tails, so this is a Chernobyl cat or something, so that's six. And then these ears have some features that look like, like maybe like look like legs, so that's like eight here. But yeah, for this one, that, that uh, line of reasoning does not work. Uh, yeah, bunch of uh, filter cases. Here it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, like a mouse hunting a lion. Uh, I'd agree, <laughs> maybe, maybe here this mouse is actually hunting this lion. That may be the case. Uh, also here, maybe the, the, the lion is dead and the mouse is actually eating the lion, but it just, yeah, went into the mouth to just check, double check some of the, I don't know, some of the uh, markers so that l the lion is healthy or something. I don't know. Uh, a car with triangular wheels here. Uh, this is, I guess, the best attempt that the model got. Uh, and this looks like something that may actually, uh, yeah, appear in a world, uh, in, in real world data sets. But yeah, it's not perfect. Um, and um, I found some other filler cases down in the ape index, like let me just kind of try and find it here. So the fine tuned model, uh, they say golden necklace, uh, they do this, this impeding, you can see here, they put a mask here, and you can see what the model, the model doesn't even produce the necklace. So there are some filler cases, obviously, it's not perfect. Also, I mentioned the, 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 the fact that Dali was failing with these, uh, like relational reasoning types of tasks and here they just put a simple one so I guess they really cherry-picked the best out of this model and we cannot test it ourselves so that's kind of that, that kind of sucks but other than that uh, this is fairly fairly awesome work um, I love the fact that they are pushing diffusion models uh, I'm not sure whether diffusion models are ever gonna be as fast as as GANs or VAEs when sampling for this very simple reason of the fact that the whole diffusion model thing uh, rests on this fact. So this distribution approaches uh, the Gaussian only when you have a bunch of steps and when you have beta t going to zero. If you manage to find a solution around this, it's not going to be diffusion model anymore or it's gonna be something different. Yeah, it's not the diffusion anymore, I guess. In any case, uh, hopefully you found this video useful. Um, again, I still don't have a camera. Hopefully in a couple of next weeks, I'm gonna get it. And uh, let me know if you found this video, uh, yeah, interesting, useful, and leave some comments, feedback, and yeah, subscribe to this channel, share it with your friends, and until next time, bye-bye.